Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. This is another in this occasional series of readings from and brief notes and commentary upon Eusebius of Caesarea's The Ecclesiastical History. Here is book 8 and chapter 10. But since we said that Phileas deserved a high reputation for his secular learning as well, let him appear as his own witness to show us who he was and, at the same time, to relate more accurately than we could the martyrdoms that took place at Alexandria. Here are his words, from the writings of Phileas to the Thamuites. Since all these examples and patterns and goodly tokens are placed before us in the divine and sacred scriptures, the blessed martyrs with us did not hesitate, but directed the eye of the soul sincerely toward the God who is over all. And with a mind resolved on death for piety, they clung fast to their calling, finding that our Lord Jesus Christ became man for our sakes, that he might destroy every kind of sin and provide us with the means of entering into eternal life. For he counted it not a prize to be on an equality with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself unto death, yea, the death of the cross. Wherefore also, desiring earnestly the greater gifts, the Christ-bearing martyrs endured every kind of suffering and all manner of devices of torture, not once, but even a second time in some cases. And, though their guards vied in all kinds of threats against them, not only in word, but also in deed, they refused to give up their resolution, because perfect love casteth out fear. What account would suffice to reckon up their bravery and courage under each torture? For when all who wished were given a free hand to insult them, some smote them with cudgels, others with rods, others with scourges, others again with straps, and others with ropes. And the spectacle of their tortures was a varied one, with no lack of wickedness therein. Some, with both hands bound behind them, were suspended upon the gibbet, and with the aid of certain machines stretched out in every limb. Then, as they lay in this plight, the torturers, acting on orders, began to lay on over their whole body, not only, as in the case of murderers, punishing their sides with the instruments of torture, but also their belly, legs, and cheeks. Others were suspended from the porch by one hand and raised aloft, and in the tension of their joints and limbs experienced unequaled agony. Others were bound with their face toward pillars, their feet not touching the ground, and thus their bonds were drawn tight by the pressures upon them of the weight of the body. And this they would endure, not while the governor conversed or was engaged with them, but almost throughout the entire day. For when he went away to others, he would leave the agents of his authority to watch the first, if, by, if perchance anyone should be overcome by the tortures and seem to give in. And he bade them approach mercilessly with bonds also. And when they were at the last gasp after all this, take them down to the ground and drag them off. For he said that they were not to have the least particle of regard for us, but to be so disposed and act as if we were no longer of any account. Such was the second torture that our enemies devised in addition to the stripes. And some, even after the tortures, were placed in the stocks, and had both feet stretched out to the fourth hole, so that they were compelled to lie on their backs therein, being unable to sit upright, because of the recent wounds they had from the stripes all over the whole body. Others were thrown to the ground and lay there, by reason of the wholesale application of the tortures, presenting to those who saw them a sight more terrible than did the actual punishment in that they bore in their bodies marks of the manifold and buried tortures that were devised. In this condition of affairs, some died under their tortures, having shamed the adversary by their endurance, while others were shut up half dead in prison, and after not many days perfected by reason of their agonies. The remainder recovered under treatment, and as a result of time and their stay in prison gained confidence. So then, when the order was given and the choice held out, either to touch the abominable sacrifice and be unmolested, receiving from them the accursed freedom, or not to sacrifice and be punished with death, 
without hesitation, they gladly went to their death. For they knew what had been prescribed for us by the sacred scriptures. For he says, He that sacrificeth unto other gods shall be utterly destroyed, and thou shalt have no other gods but me. Such are the words of the martyrs, of the martyr, true lover both of wisdom and of God, which he sent to the brethren in his community before the final sentence, when he was still in a state of imprisonment, at one and the same time showing the conditions in which he was living, and also stirring them up to hold fast to the fear of God in Christ, even after his death, who is just about to be perfected. But why need one make a long story and add fresh instance upon instance of the conflicts of the godly martyrs throughout the world, especially of those who were assailed no longer by, by the common law, but as if they were enemies? Here ends book 8 and chapter 10, and we will move on to some notes and commentary. This chapter features a first-person report from Phileas, Bishop of Thamuis, a town in Lower Egypt, on the martyrdoms that took place in Alexandria. Phileas is described as a true lover, both of wisdom and of God. He wrote this while he was himself imprisoned, and we learn from the previous chapter in Book 8, Chapter 9, that Phileas uh, himself suffered martyrdom uh, by being uh, beheaded. Uh, in the first personal report that he wrote back to his church in Thamuis, uh, he expresses his admiration for the Christ-bearing martyrs, for their ability to remain steadfast despite undergoing various gruesome tortures and sufferings uh, for their faith. Uh, he, uh, of interest, notes the so-called Christ hymn in Philippians 2, 5-11, uh, as Christ giving a model of one who emptied himself and who suffered and was obedient uh, even unto death. After cruel torture, uh, some uh, died under their torture. Others were released, and they were placed in stocks and underwent more uh, suffering, or they were simply thrown to the ground. Uh, some of those who didn't die under torture would die later from the wounds that they suffered, while others were able to recover. And Phileas can report that such persons gained confidence and then when they were given a choice either to go free and be unmolested or uh, by offering the sacrifices or to face death, uh, if they remained steadfast, that such persons who had recovered from their tortures, that they chose death. Uh, this chapter, in conclusion, continues the account of the sufferings of the Egyptian Christians during the Diocletian persecution. It is striking that uh, this uh, chapter gives this first-hand report from the imprisoned bishop who would himself become a martyr. Again, uh, Eusebius stresses the courage, the steadfastness of the martyrs uh, in the face of the Diocletian persecution, and they are remembered with uh, admiration. And, of course, this is meant to be a great encouragement to the Christian reader uh, and to have sympathy for those who suffered uh, such duress uh, during this time. Well, this brings this uh, episode to a conclusion. I hope this has been profitable for those who are listening, and I will look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Till then, take care and God bless.